The following interview was conducted with David Ritz, the, uh, the director of the Cooperative Extension Program. This is part two of the interview. It's for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, June 15th, 2007, and at Purdue University's Campus TV studio. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you. And, Pleasure uh, to be back. And i like to start, I think the first part, we'd like to talk a little bit about the Extension Service a little more in, in depth and its growth and, you know, when it became legal in 1914, its growth within, within the state and its impact on the residents in Purdue and agriculture. I'm trying to also put this in as focus for researchers who will be using this tape for research along that line. The federal, uh, what should I say, the Congressional Act that created, if you will, provided federal funding for uh, extension started in 1914, uh, the Smith-Lever Act. Um, obviously very much of a watershed of funding to support what many states were already doing. Um, for instance, uh, cooperative, the extension service uh, started here at Purdue and was recognized by the General Assembly of Indiana uh, in 1905 and we celebrated our 100th anniversary two years ago. Um, the 4-H program uh, in Indiana started actually in, I think, 1904, so there was actually 4-H existed per se a year earlier. Mm -hmm. So when you begin to look back through history, you find that farmers were looking for knowledge, as were many people, but uh, at that time farming was just kind of traditional. Uh, Texas claims uh, to have the first extension agent, and uh, it, the idea grew from there, and so it became around the country that you had counties or multi-counties or states or somebody employing a local person who was an expert in crop production, livestock production. Um, then it continued to expand with 4-H already underway, and then they began to do some of the, what we call that time, home economics. Uh, the community uh, development part of it really didn't get started until the late 20s and then into the 30s when communities started struggling with, you know, we're betwixt and between. Uh, we're not big enough to uh, grow on our own and we're too small to die or survive, so what do we do? So extension really began to expand outward uh, in terms of program, in terms of numbers, uh, in terms of funding. Uh, because Smith-Lever was a matching cooperative. Uh, the cooperative referred to the funding that states and counties had to put up money. And uh, states were very flexible and fluid in how they came up with the money. Indiana came up primarily through uh, county governments over the years, and uh, actually that became part of state law. Uh, states like Illinois depended heavily on farm organizations. In Illinois, it was the Illinois Farm Bureau and support that each county Farm Bureau provided for extension. Um, and even in my lifetime, uh, Illinois Farm Bureau was still a heavy supporter of extension and uh, sending regular checks to the local extension office to support the local office. So it grew from the beginnings of people saying there's research knowledge, there's a better way, we want to know what it is. We had people on campus and you needed to bridge it in between. And uh, that's how okay. really extension started and began to grow. And uh, we have maintained that same traditional structure in Indiana now for a hundred and some years, whereas other states have migrated to many other creative, maybe better, better or worse, I'm not sure, uh, types of organizational structures. Right. In the, you had mentioned the 30s, what impact, if any, was of some help to the farmers during the Depression? Uh, they were some in terms of just survival. Okay. Um, and obviously the other part of the, I'll say, source of knowledge for farmers was the Soil and Water Conservation Service that Congress established uh, uh, in the drought years of the 30s when you had the Great Dust Bowl in the Great Plains. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the dust uh, blowing literally into Washington, D.C. that convinced Congress we got to do something. And so farmers begin to then depend on not only extension, but soil and water conservation and other sources of knowledge to uh, 
have more environmentally friendly methods of farming, uh, but also new methods. I think the other thing that helped extension was the beginning of hybrid seed corn, uh, of nitrogen fertilizer, of uh, lime uh, to offset the acidity in the soil. There was a lot of wives' tales, uh, is one way of putting it, uh, that, you know, I grew up in a farm family where fertilizer was something really questioned, and if you're going to use nitrogen fertilizer, that's going to poison the soil you put too much on. And uh, extension people of the 30s and 40s were very strong personalities because they not only had to carry the information out, they had to convince the people this is a better way and it's based on research. And of course some people had their own view of university research at that time too, you know, you academics that don't understand what we do. Uh, what you do with the land? You know, you know nothing about what I'm trying to do out here to survive and I can't believe you're doing research that's coming up with answers to do it better. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm sure you could find people who farmed in the 30s and 40s would tell you all sorts of stories about whatever, uh, whether it was livestock production, crop production. Um, you also then found at the same time in the 20s and 30s that farm wives had a significant role not only in the home and how to do a better job of uh, nutrition, of fabrics, of uh, just keeping the whole family mentally together, um, but also are an integral part of the farm business. And so you found uh, the home economics portion. portion of ag really took off. 4-H was probably the one that grew the fastest because it became the way for, if you will, the rural farm kids to have a gathering point that people trusted was safe uh, and pretty much everybody else was alike. And it was a real way of teaching and sending the education home to the adults was to Represent. show the kids how to do whatever. That brings up another, uh, well, gonna, the careers, it's helped in careers in agriculture such as 4-H, has it yes. not? Yes. So the co-op really has, has had a great impact. I th we had a great impact and I think it's still true today. Uh, Dean Woodson in agriculture has said that one of the reasons why the College of Agriculture usually is a disproportionate winner of university-wide student awards is because of 4-H, uh, FFA, we have good leaders coming into college and then we just enhance and uh, hone those skills while they're students here and they wind up being student leaders. Mm -hmm. And so the other part of it is, is that you gain the knowledge out there of there is something else other than farming. Uh, young people saw different careers, visited their universities, uh, and you know, I don't have to go back to farm. Uh, or I can be involved with the farm but be an agribusiness person, or I can go be a scientist or a doctor. 4-H mm -hmm. uh, acquainted a lot of young people who today are adults and retirees, uh, acquainted them with things that they would have never known back in the 20s and 30s or 40s without having been involved in a 4-H program or FFA program to have that acquaintance with the rest of the world. And it develops leadership skills for the people. Many of them come, as you just said a moment ago, with that when they come to Purdue because they've experienced it during the, at the high school. Very so, much so. Yeah. Um, and the other part that Extension did for adults was uh, many of our leadership programs over the years uh, honed the skills of uh, people as adults had leadership skills. Somebody just had to hone them and help them guide those skills. And so you found adult leaders in communities would trace their uh, uh, beginnings of leadership back to being on the Extension Board, uh, serving on the 4-H Council, the Fair Board, being a 4-H volunteer, where somebody could take that adult and kind of tease out of them their own leadership skills and say, you can do this. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, what are some, uh, cha have you noticed any, any changes uh, in the extension service on your watch or what, any projections for the future as far as the service? Any thought about a little bit about that? Changes. Well, we talked the last time yeah. about the drought of 1988, sure. which That's unfortunately future. is a t topic of conversation this very afternoon, June right. 15th. There's a meeting going on in the college about, so what are we going to do about what appears to be another severe drought? Getting information to people, whether it was farmers, uh, 
families, communities, you know, the information distribution. In 1988, we put in an 800 number and we went around the state doing meetings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now you can put it up on a website. Uh, you can do breeze broadcasts, IP video broadcasts. We can sit here and do a broadcast direct from Purdue University. Mm -hmm. There's so many different ways of getting information out. That is probably the major change. The other major change is just simply the issues that people face today that we didn't think of eight years ago when I started this job, whether it's meth, whether it's uh, immigration, uh, whether it's uh, demographics, uh, you know, health, obesity, you name it. Most of these are topics today that five, ten years ago we hadn't really thought a lot about. And then the other way of getting the information out to people, we, you know, who would have dreamed 10 or 20 years ago that, you know, we have all the technology we do today. That's right. And yeah. that only change. Um, but, and we talked earlier in the, uh, that there are computers, so there's, most of them have access oh, yeah. uh, at the farm level, at the home level. Probably two-thirds, three-fourths of the farm families have computer service uh, as, I think, both state and national leadership look at broadband service in communities. Uh, I would say the next extension director will probably enjoy the opportunity that you can safely say nearly every home, one way or the other, will have access to the internet. Uh, it may be limited, but there will be a method of distributing knowledge to just about anybody out there. Um, since the tragedy in Virginia Tech, uh, you know, everybody's looking at how do you get the word out to everybody right now? And uh, working with an entity, a large entity, not Purdue, but another one, uh, they're having every volunteer and every person on, on interim payroll submit their cell phone number and their email address. And if they send something's wrong, uh, they've purchased the technology that will simply send this, you know, blast message to every cell phone uh, recorded message. Um, you know, again, uh, you just don't, you can't because phantom this. I think of Jess Lohenberg de Boer talking about being in parts of South Africa, uh, southern part of Africa, where people are growing, and I forget which crop it is, a very modest crop, uh, and people have learned in the larger communities to broadcast market reports to uh, I'll say the small villagers out in the middle of nowhere, market prices in the village market square on their cell phones. And all of a sudden you have somebody that has no radio, no TV, but he or she knows what the market price is down at the village square today because somebody put it out on the cell phone system. Isn't it amazing how the cell phones oh, yeah. are your, your, your quick thing and worldwide? Oh, yeah. You know. And you're seeing, you know, uh, there's a new phone coming out here towards the end of June uh, that will combine all of everything you ever want in one handheld little pocket phone. You know, it's hard to say, almost describe what has happened, let alone try to guess what will happen. But I think I can safely say technology will continue to change and the issues will continue to change. Uh, it behooves the land-grant university to be prepared for both. All right. Um, now I want to move, talk a little bit about engagement. Uh, I see that um, this is marking the going to Madison County, the seventh stop in six years since President Jeske initiated the visits. And a certain quote, the university's engagement efforts, Purdue and Extension, have partnered with many organizations in areas such as economic development and homeland security. I'm going to have a few other things, but the homeland security, how is that? That's something new. Um, well, again, it it's fa it factored into the engagement, and engagement is something relatively new, that terminology mm -hmm. for Purdue, and that's one of the reasons we were asking those. Excuse well, me. let's go to engagement. Yeah. Obviously, it's a word uh, that was very dear to Martin Jiske when the Kellogg report was done in the late 90s. It uh, was a term that he felt uh, more appropriately described what land-grant should be doing with people. Uh, engagement, to me, means a dialogue. Uh, Far too often, people in extension would go out, I'm the expert, you need to know this knowledge, and after I give it to you, you will be better because of it. Uh, I never asked you if you needed the knowledge or if it isn't relevant. 
think Martin Jiski's feeling was you need to go ask people what they want and you work with them and then two you partner with them and make this happen together and so that's how engagement kind of we see it working more with people and whether it's the traditional extension or reaching out to companies or communities or organizations. Homeland security uh, is just one of many topics. For years extension service had what we called a disaster handbook. The disasters were typically storms, weather, uh, earthquake, fire, massive fires, floods, um, droughts. Man-made kind of thing. Well, either man-made or, you know, weather, weather related. Right. Uh, but they really didn't touch much on what if somebody decided to be a terrorist and do something that you couldn't handle. So extension and the engagement system became very naturally the way to reach out to county emergency management people, to county health departments, to many different entities. Uh, even some of the university's uh, technical assistance program reach out to companies and say, so what would you do if, you know, you had a tornado came through and destroyed your building? What's your computer backup? Uh, where would you move? Um, so the Homeland Security was just a natural addition to the menu and the portfolio of the topics we're able to talk about. And, uh, and had been talking about. Had been talking about it. We just, Homeland Security took on a whole different role after 9-11. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. And then that part became part of the thing. <clears throat> is, um, what is the difference when, you know, in the, in the SEAL, they talk about service, but now they're using the term engagement. Is it simil somewhat similar? Because sometimes the researchers will say, well, when I look at land grant, service was the word that, that was, you know, in there. And now it, it's a little different application. Is that how? It is, it isn't. Uh -huh. um, I think it goes back to when I came to Purdue and even up to a few years ago, the word service ap appeared on the faculty promotion and tenure document. You did research, you did teaching, or you did service. Um, and service became a very nebulous term in a person's promotion document. We still are working trying to help everybody understand what does engagement slash outreach slash extension really mean when you put it on a promotion and tenure document. Some people would say, well, it's just simply you go out there and you have a Rotary Club lunch. Uh, that's fine. Uh, you extend the knowledge of the university to a group of people. But if you start thinking about not only helping those people, but what's the most effective way to help educate them? What's the scholarship of engagement? Uh, what's the most effective way? It's the same as teaching. Uh, you may have great teaching ratings in a classroom, but if you don't share your ability, I'm sorry, not ability, but how you achieve those great teaching ratings, how you help students learn, and share that with your peers, you're really not much of a scholar of teaching. And so we struggle still trying to explain the scholarship of engagement to people. Um, service is a word we have kept it in our title um, yeah. here at a Cooperative Extension Service, which was the original title. Uh, some states have switched the system. Some states have just simply uh, dropped, gone to Ohio State Extension. Um, they decided not to worry about it. Was it service, system, whatever? We'll just not worry about the last word. Service also carries the connotation of being more of a, um, you know, of service to, I, I guess some people put it in a light of serving, being more of a, um, uh, a, giver. A, a giver, a workman type thing, whereas others said no, extension is more about education, it's more about knowledge. Service was a demeaning way of referring to what we did, and so you had a whole bunch of mixed mindsets about the word service. Mm -hmm. um, Somebody made a cutout of for extension up in the attic of our building. I was looking at it, and I see one of the words in there is service. Uh, I believe uh, the home economics program, when it was still part of agriculture, uh, used the term service. Uh, 
So again, it's one of those mystical words that it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And some people, I still get notes from some people say, please don't take service out of our title because that's what we do. Uh, others kind of like, I don't do that. So yeah. It has different applications and connotations. You have to put it in the context in which you're looking or ex um, discussing it yes. with. I this think. Is, we could have a long discussion if you had six faculty sitting here from across the university and say, define the engagement. Uh, you'd probably get out of six people, eight or nine different opinions. Okay. Uh, extension, most people who are traditional ag college people know what extension does, is, uh, what their role in it is. Um, some colleges collapse it all in outreach. Uh, so mm. it's a whole bunch of words. Uh, you know, everybody knows what classroom teaching is. Pretty near everybody has an idea of what a researcher does in one fashion or another. But you say, I'm an extension, and you kind of get that mystical look like, okay, so what exactly do you do? Well, I help people with information to help them improve their lives or communities. All right. And I think if I would experience that, just with the word outreach, what, yeah. you know, you're reaching, are you reaching out like the United Way or something? Yeah. So you do get... Very much. It's, it's... And it's always been that it's way. It's a challenge. It's interesting. Yes. Um, the um, the impact of the uh, share. Can you share some of the highlights of your visits to some of the cities um, and how that? I think that would be very helpful to the researchers and their impact on the, on the what do you well, to see afterwards or here. I'm struggling about where to start because okay. there's so many high points. Uh, okay. As you know, Martin Jiski, uh, when you put Martin Jiski, whether it's small group or large group, there's high points and it's, you always walk out of there saying, wow. Um, his self-definition one day, somebody asked him when he was over in the Ag College about doing these and I was sitting in the back of the room and they said, so tell us about your community visits. This is his term, not mine. He says, I was embarrassed. He said it was like the arrival of a rock star. And he said, you know, I have these outpourings of people and my name on signboards and stuff. Well, um, to be very honest, I wouldn't put Martin Jiski in the rock star category, but in terms of a highly visible person that was highly respected, people were very proud to have him come to their town or to their company, whether it was a big company or a small company. They were thrilled to have him come and speak to their Rotary Club or their luncheon. I mean, I've had Martin Jiski in all the way from kindergarten classes to seniors in high school. Um, there is just simply this aura about the man that people had, my God, he came to see us. He talked to us. He answered my question. And so I think the first thing was there was always this feeling in every town that, wow, he came here and he is really good. High points, um, a standing ovation in Bloomington uh, from basically an IU crowd. Um, well, Bobby that, Knight was gone, so that made Bobby it Knight was gone. Adam Herbert shared the podium, but they gave Martin Jiski the standing ovation. Um, people who told me outside the door, I bleed red for IU, and he's the finest man I've ever met, uh, greatest college leader I've ever met. Uh, Martin Jiski could walk in any company. Uh, I don't care whether they made airplane parts or transmissions or bed springs. He took a sincere interest in understanding what they were doing, how they were doing it, and either offered suggestions from his own expertise or would say, you make sure you get a hold of this person. He knows the answer to the problem you face. The other part of, I believe, that always I thought when he sat down at a boardroom table with business leaders, 
The, these would be their local people. Local people sure. uh, from any company or a group of companies. They treated him like a peer because he understood business and the struggles and the challenges that a leader of a large corporation would face, whether it was health care, whether it was labor, whether it was uh, productivity. Um, they saw him as a peer who could sit at the table and talk with them about how to solve or resolve a problem. Uh, I have never saw anybody treat Martin Jiske as an academic who came to my company in town and he's here for the show and he could care less. Um, never once did I ever see Martin act that way and never once did I see an audience or an individual feel like he's just here because of the visibility. He's here because he genuinely believes in engagement and he wants to hear what I have to say. Um, I've been on fun stops with him. Uh, we went to a company that built top fuel dragsters. Uh, he was as animated about what goes into building a top fuel dragster as we were when we went to Rolls Royce and saw him building a, a jet engine and go farther, faster, and higher. Um, he was just as enamored with going to a place in southern Indiana that made soups or a place in uh, Fishers that made packaged candy uh, or going to see Hummers made in uh, South Bend, I mean, or steel made, and we've been to several steel plants. Uh, every place we went, he took a genuine interest, and the people were extremely proud of having him there. The point of it was that in every case, those people felt Purdue knows the answers to my questions. And in many cases, they hadn't really realized that Purdue had an answer to the question. We went to a steel plant a year ago. Uh, I swore the management of the steel plant would have gotten a van and ridden home with us if there had been room because they heard us talking about nanotechnology. And they said, we've been looking for answers for that for two years. Uh, they wanted to know what we knew about the nano aspect of steel. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to know it right then and there. And uh, so, you know, uh, we went to huge companies and we went to companies that employed five people. And uh, it was always the same and it was always a very positive engagement with those people. And he, he, he walked the talk of engagement. I think that's the way I would summarize mm. it. And in the smaller, uh, many of the smaller towns, this, this is an opportunity that uh, some of them would, would never have had to be able to see him. Oh, and right. That's right. The larger ones too, but the smaller ones, they don't. Some of them, I don't travel or don't get around perhaps as much. They were thrilled to have him come to a town like Rensselaer or Frankfurt, or um, I'm trying to think of some of the other small towns we've been to. Typically, uh, we didn't hit a lot of small towns because it was very hard to fill a complete day. Uh, but in other cases, I usually wound up in the middle of, okay, now I have to decide who gets his visit and who's left off the list. Okay. And so there's always this confidentiality of trying to set up a tour and getting everybody to buy into it before you ever announced it because you didn't want hurt feelings of right. saying, I'm sorry, I can't get there. Right. Um, He's pulled the plug on a few stops, uh, or on a few days where weather, uh, being called to Washington, an issue on campus. I only had one weather disaster where we were in southern Indiana and the governor was coming to dinner that night at Westwood and uh, the yeah. airport called and said, you are going to have to be on the plane coming home at noon or he won't be home to have dinner with the governor. And I explained to Martin that he had a choice and we left. And uh, so, again, it's like this trip that we're going to Anderson in the coming week. Um, we're visiting small startup companies, uh, and we're going to a company that's 62 years old that is one of the, I guess, a world renowned uh, uh, tooling and engineering company. We're going to see the plans for the new Nestle plant. Uh, in Anderson. The plant's not built, but we're meeting with the corporate leadership of the plant, and uh, I'm sure uh, Martin will want to talk to him about what Purdue can pr provide for them mm -hmm. and uh, say, you know, you make sure you follow up, and we'll follow up with you.
This is another outcome, it appears to me, from, your, from what you're saying, is that it tells the people more than what actually what many of the involvement that the university is engaged yes. in, in addition to education, what the mm -hmm. land grant yes. um, you know, focus is. Mm -hmm. And for some people, they're not that familiar with, say, Lano College, but not the land grant, right. and that's what the focus is. Um, one thing, do you notice the difference between, say, the northern and southern Indiana? Because southern, the southern is more rural, more agriculture. Is it? Um, is yes and no. Uh -huh. um, I can go up here to Benton County or Jasper County, and it's very rural. Uh, you can go to southern Indiana. It's smaller farms, unless you go to southwestern Indiana where the river bottoms are large farms. But by and large, you'll get into south central and southeastern Indiana, smaller towns, smaller communities. And I'd also say even where they've had residential development coming out from Louisville or Columbus or some of the other towns, uh, lower income, uh, and those communities struggle to keep everything together as a community governmental unit mm -hmm. uh, compared to more towns in central and northern Indiana that have more of a economic industrial base, more jobs, uh, and easier access to more jobs in larger communities not that far away. Mm -hmm. uh, there's quite a difference and you'll also, we saw that when we traveled with President Jiske. Uh, the other thing that I think is different between southern Indiana and the other parts of Indiana is there's lesser opportunities to, for a short drive to gain education in southern Indiana compared to central and north where there's a lot more opportunities in the neighboring town, for instance, to go to an Ivy Tech, uh, Indiana Wesleyan, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was one of the reasons why it was so exciting to see the new Purdue facility go in uh, the New Albany of bringing mm -hmm. engineering to the New Albany uh, community. All right. And you notice that there's a presence, and I think that's been enhanced as the presence of, of other facilities in addition to the statewide technology program for or classes and things of that sort. There is been. Uh, we now obviously Columbus offers classes, New Albany will offer classes, uh, some of the extension offices through learning centers offer classes. Um, there's many more opportunities for, I don't like the word, um, um, organized, uh, it's not the word I'm searching for, but for credit classes, uh, in, formal classes uh, right. versus informal. A lot of people refer to extension, we're back to service. They refer to extension as informal education, and I never <laughs> thought it was very informal, uh, but uh, there's a lot more opportunities in central and northern Indiana for formal education and for credit education. And also for continuing if you want to just take some classes if you haven't been in school for right. a while and, yes. and you want to hone up some skills and things of that sort. Um, we're talking, we've been talking a lot about farming. Um, talk about the family farm. How has that changed over time? Is it still around? The family, Coming from what? The, the family farm. Far the farm family exists. It's just that it's not the structure of the farm family that you had 20 years ago, mm -hmm. 25 years ago. I'll say prior to the real crash in the farm economy in the early 80s. Prior to that, I'd say there was a semblance of the traditional farm family. Uh, the father and the children, maybe a grandfather, were involved in production agriculture and the female in the family, at least the adult female, mm -hmm. was the homemaker. Uh, with the crash in the farm economy in the 80s, uh, the kids had to go find off-farm jobs. Mom probably had to find a job, and it may have been to the point where the husband had to find an off-farm job and farm at night. Um, with that, you wound up with farm families becoming very much like the suburban urban families where everybody's on the go, and if you all happen to meet at the a table to have a meal together it was a coincidence rather than planned. But there is a farm family out there. There's young people graduating from Purdue and other places going back to farm with older generations. Uh, the farms are much larger. The farms are much more complicated and probably the members of that partnership now have specific expertise and roles in the farm business compared to what they might have had 25 years ago. Somebody may understand machinery, 
Uh, mom may be doing the books or doing the marketing. Um, everybody's got a highly technical role now compared to uh, everybody does everything. Right. And you usually have one or more employees around uh, mm -hmm. where prior to 1980, unless it was a very large farm, uh, the only labor was family labor. Right, I see, okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your t teaching experiences, interaction with the students over time. Very limited uh, because of extensive travels with extension. Um, in the 1970s, I uh, was advisor to uh, the Ag Econ Club a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, I was a faculty fellow uh, until the early 1980s in Windsor Hall. Um, I really was not heavily and probably lesser involved with students uh, through the 80s and then when I got into beginnings of administration in the 1990s I had almost no contact with students. Then when I became director I also became interim head of the 4-H uh, youth development department so all of a sudden I went from not being involved with students to being in a department that had a lot and now uh, Extension supports several graduate students so I'm heavily involved with graduate programs. What is your involvement with that particular department? That you tell, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, um, what, uh, we changed department heads in about 2000, 2001. Um, oh, there had been a head of this There department. had been former heads okay. um, and the head at that time chose not to. Um, I said for the time being that well it was we'd already had talked about reorganizing the department making some different organizational structures with about three different departments and trading off some things with the College of Education and we felt it wasn't a wise investment to go out and look for a new department head because you might say to a department head well here's the job today but next year it could be this so I just volunteered at the wrong time and said okay I'll be the interim head and uh, I brought in somebody to be my executive officer and uh, I guess I was the acting interim department head for about four years and then after the reorganization they hired a department head and uh, so out of it came the youth development ag education department. Mm -hmm. um, Did you do any teaching at all when you were no, out there? No. no. Oh, just um, I've only, the only time I formally taught a class on campus was Seven, let's see, 78, 79, or 79, 80, I can't remember. I taught one year while somebody else was on sabbatic, and I volunteered to teach the class just because I thought it would be something new and different. Mm -hmm. um, it's a challenge being on the road with extension and teaching. Okay. Uh, I have immense respect for a classroom teacher who is going to stay current and stay ahead of the students. Um, you know, if you put a class together and you just want to go in day after day, year after year, teach the same class, same notes, same overheads, um, the students are not getting their money's worth. That's right. That's right. And have you done any uh, mentoring uh, at, at, at all? Well, probably in your extension work, I would I've say. done ex that's key. Mentoring in both my extension work of young extension specialists coming in and then also, you know, I won't say it's formal mentoring as much as role modeling and working right. with and sitting down with uh, junior administrators to kind of help them. Um, in these days of retirement, I get notes from colleagues around the country who said, well, you helped me with this, you helped me with that. Uh, I got a note the other day that says, I still remember a speech you gave in 1995. Um, I'm not a formal mentor. I try to show people there's a right and a wrong. I try to help them assess the situation and uh, make their own decisions, I guess is the way I describe my mentor. Sort of shield them or guide them along and, and give them, you know. Right. I think a big part of it is is encouragement, uh, encouragement to assess the situation and actually make a decision. Uh, the other part of it is is worrying about details. Uh, Eisenhower once said that making the decision to invade Normandy was a relatively easy decision. Uh, the next two years of worrying about all the details and making sure somebody else carried them out was the tough part of that decision. <laughs> And that's kind of the way of my job. Uh, I can make decisions fairly easily. 
making then the assessment that all the details are taking place to make the person successful is what I worry about. All right. All right. Um, I was real pleased to hear about that uh, David Parrott's endowment. And, well, thank you. Uh, um, I think that's very nice. How, can, how did you happen to find out about it? Um, or did you, if you don't care to share that. No, I'd be glad nice. to. Um, I, think I think it's wonderful. To and the, the people purpose work for which that it's going to be used, I think it's excellent. When I announced my retirement, there, of course, there was the immediate, oh, we got to do this, we got to have a dinner, we got to have a party, we got to have this. And I'm sorry, first of all, I'm very humble. Uh, you probably won't believe it, and Brian is looking at me from behind the camera, so he doesn't believe it either, but I'm relatively an introvert, and I'd just as soon have my own space. Um, I'm down here. And secondly, I did not want people spending money on meals or whatever they were going to spend money on. Uh, two of my staff and I went to lunch one day, and we were sitting there and finished lunch, and one said, the other, well, you ask them. No, you ask them. Okay, so what's gone wrong that somebody's got to ask me about? Well, uh, would you be supportive of having an endowment in your name? Yeah, I would. I'm really thrilled by that because I'm too humble to say I, that's what I wanted, but when they brought it up, that's what I did want, was I wanted not so much my name on it. That wasn't the point. I wanted a way of gathering money that would perpetuate at least a fund of money for the next extension director and the next extension director to have to support professional development of educators. Uh, they could have called it any name they wanted to. Uh, I didn't care whether my name was on it. I just wanted the way to gather funding and have it there in perpetuity. So. It came off of a lunch deal that somebody else had dreamed up, but I was thrilled that they have. Um, I have some wonderful friends who have said they're going to make it successful. Um, and uh, it's, it's taken off in a life of its own, and I'm thrilled. That's very, I think that's a very um, nice idea. The other thing that I'm thrilled by since we met the last time I've uh, been notified of one a very uh, prestigious national award, which I was astonished by uh, and very honored by. And uh, there's another award here in Indiana I can't talk about because I've been pledged to confidentiality until uh, the organization announces it, but I was also very taken by it. Can you not get the first one? Can you give us First one is there's a, a, a national extension honorary called Epsilon Sigma Phi uh, ESP. And they have an annual national award called the Ruby Award. Uh, it's a singular award each year. Uh, some very outstanding people have won it, so I'm humbled by the company I've been put in. Uh, and they notified me about a month ago that I won that. And I can say here uh, that my staff is probably more excited than I am. I'm honored. They're excited that I won, and they went to all the work of getting me nominated, and so I'm happy for them. And the other thing I feel about it is the award has my name on it, but it also reflects the fact that Purdue Extension is recognized nationwide as a very good organization, and uh, so it's all of their awards. It's not just my award. When is it going to be given? The uh, 13th of September in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, that will be nice. So. Uh, it will be an opportunity to, uh, the catch in it is uh, I have to give a lecture. Uh, I wish I could just run this tape and be that, but they say I have to give a 20 minute lecture and uh, I've already told you how long it goes been since I taught. So it's been a long time since <laughs> I lectured. So I'm struggling with what I'm gonna talk about. You got some time. Um, we've asked this to some of our other people. You know the tape and transcript are gonna be turned over to the archives. Yes. Any thoughts on preservation and special collections? And you know, we do have a new facility which will be coming, and then we have the McCutcheon and the Amelia Earhart. And we have some agriculture things in, in there too that were given a long time ago, some reports that before I was in there. Well, it's too hot for us to go to the attic today because it's 90 outside and it's about 110 in our attic. Um, Catherine, you need to sit down with me this fall when it's cool. Uh, there is a mountain of old documentation about extension and research in the attic of Ag Administration Building. 
Uh, and I literally mean that, and I guess I open the invitation for you, if you can stand the dust, to uh, come look at it. Well, well I believe Morris, she'd be the one she's ahead. I believe very strongly in the archives and this type of a history and any kind of a history of an institution such as Purdue. Um, Thank you. Purdue is a unique institution in Indiana, in the nation, and I think in the world of how we were founded. Uh, all land grants have a very unique uh, path that where that conception began and, you know, until they grew up. It's like you and I talking before we started taping about the tenure of the presidents. Um, not many people know that, probably until you help them understand the importance of length of tenure, do you appreciate the fact you ought to at least look it up and read. Um, it's much like uh, President Shortridge. Uh, I took President Jiski to Shortridge School in Indianapolis and he quizzed the students, you know where the name of the school came from? Of course not, they have no idea. And he, you know, told them who, well, it's named after the president of Purdue. Uh, actually, I think Mr. Shortridge was also somebody in Indianapolis that probably got his name there first, but uh, I'll leave that as it may. I, as I said the last time, I came to Purdue and heard stories of President Hovde, of Al Stewart, of R.B. Stewart, um, of the forefathers of Purdue who shaped it, who guided it, uh, crafted it, molded it. Uh, Purdue would be a far different place if uh, President Hovde hadn't been here for so many years and rode through the post-World War II days mm -hmm. of the vets all coming back to school. Uh, Purdue wouldn't have been here if he hadn't believed so strongly in the engineering, uh, but he also believed in agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, obviously we have a fine library system, so he believed in that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I just hope that we maintain all of this, uh, whether it's Amelia Earhart or some research publication that came out in the 1920s or 30s out of agriculture that people look back at and said, I can't believe they wrote this a hundred years right. ago. Right. You know, well, sidebar, right. um, in World War II, uh, hemp was uh, a very uh, much of a product produced on Midwestern farms. Uh, now, hemp is also, in today's age, known as marijuana. Uh, we have extension publications on how to successfully produce hemp. Um, and we had pictures of, you know, right and wrong ways and how to harvest it and everything else. And, uh, some of those ag bulletins. Some of those ag bulletins are very interesting. <laughs> All right. Any uh, questions that I failed to ask that you would like to raise or anything special in summary? And your next, the next step, the next stage is? The next step for me is uh, family, a family farm business to disperse of. Uh, I'll be remaining in West Lafayette. Uh, I probably will continue to be involved with whatever activities that Purdue will let me be involved in, uh, pro bono or free or paid if it, of a nature. As I told somebody before I came over here, I may be cast into the spirit of Jacob Marley's ghost uh, if I'm around too much, so I need to be careful. Um, I think the other thing that new president, but still, if you look at the core people of Purdue University, the core faculty, staff, students, there's a Purdue way that I can't describe what the mindset is, but there is a mindset that there's a Purdue way um, that some of us old timers remember. Part of it was, we'll do this until the job is done. Uh, we'll do it right. Uh, there's a certain amount of Purdue pride. Um, and I guess I sincerely hope that the people that take both of our places down the road and years to come will maintain that Purdue pride. Uh, because it is a very essential ingredient of the success of this fine university. Right. I agree. I think another thing I'd suggest is that uh, with this oral history would be good to kind of do a little follow-up maybe within a year to get a sequence. Mm -hmm. uh, I say that because some of the people that, that I've been talking to are filling in the gaps 
but they have not come mm -hmm. back, such as a yeah. Friday Avenue. And I think it would I'd be, be a more nice happy, addition. and I'll be available, yeah. and you can oh, you know, I still be, be available through the same office, and uh, they'll find me. And I, I think it'd be a lot of fun too to come back because the last weeks of anyone's job is hectic, as right. you're trying to get everything done. Uh, which I didn't have an appreciation for what all that meant until the last few weeks. Uh, you give me six months or a year and I recover, I'll probably remember <laughs> things that before I never thought of. Uh, and I think there's other ways of, you'll have a new perspective. You're going to step outside and look back in and say, oh yeah, now I understand what I was trying to say the first time. This gives a nice thread to the oral history program, I think yes. it would be very good. I think it's great. And okay. I sincerely hope that written word, the captured word here of electronic media, uh, will be preserved for perpetuity in any way we can. Right. Um, you know, we all see old tapes and files from Purdue and pictures, and you chuckle and you look at it, and yet I respect, look what those people did 50 years ago. Right. I agree. Uh, look what they had to go through to sit down with a video or a taping machine back in those days. Uh, took a lot of equipment to do what uh, they're doing upstairs in the control room today. That's right. So um, it's just a very exciting time. Uh, it will continue to be exciting, and Purdue will be at the forefront right. of it. And we'll be there. We'll be there. They're right. I think this, anything else? Any summary? I just want to thank you for doing this. I want to thank you. My, uh, my pleasure, and I, I look forward to a follow-up. Okay, okay, keep in touch. We Best will. wishes. Okay, thank you.